And so the opportunity came and I basically just told her that um, I was a Christian, I believed in Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins, gave her the gospel and the backlash was horrendous. I mean, really horrendous. She screamed, she passed out, she attacked Latif and said, he's done this to me, he's put me through so much already and now he's made me a Christian oh. and this is so wrong and I'll never forgive you and you need to get out. You cannot live in my home anymore. Hi guys, welcome back to Raw Mission podcast where we bring you challenging and inspiring stories of ordinary folks sharing the good news of our extraordinary God in some of the toughest parts of the world. Do you ever think that missionaries are super spiritual, somehow on a different level to other followers of Jesus? Well, one of the aims of this podcast is to break that myth. Those who go are no different to those who stay. We're flawed, we're sinful, we do things we're not proud of. In fact, many of us see ourselves as more like Jonah than the Apostle Paul but we've tasted the goodness and grace of God in our own lives, and we feel compelled to share it with others. We've seen the majesty and authority of King Jesus, and we're jealous for his name and his glory. And we've seen the need, the 1.9 billion Muslims worldwide, the vast majority of whom have no access to the gospel, with no followers of Jesus nearby, with no church, and we can't look away. I'm Matt, your host, and today I'll be talking with a wonderful couple from London who we're calling Latif and Fatima. They'll be sharing about their arranged marriage, the real difficulties they had in their early days together as a couple, how they came to faith in Jesus despite growing up in Muslim families, and the rejection they faced from their loved ones. They'll also be talking about how the Lord surprised them a year or so ago with a call to move to the Middle East in their retirement years and to share Jesus with Muslims there. Well, hi guys. Good to see you. I've got Latif and Fatima here today with me. You guys are zooming in from somewhere in the Middle East. And yeah, I'm just so excited to hear your story because although we've connected just briefly in the past year, we haven't ever really sat down and I've never heard your story. Yeah, let's start off with, yeah, where you guys grew up and tell us a bit about your background, uh, how you came to faith and perhaps how you met as well. Okay, so I was born in London to Muslim immigrant parents. Mm. who came from the Middle East to settle there. I'm one of three siblings, an older brother who sadly died 12 years ago, Mm. and a younger brother. Um, Grew up in London. Uh, My ethnic language was my first language at home. Mm. And so when I went to school, I didn't know a word of English, which was pretty difficult. Uh, But I soon picked it up and soon grasped it. And I would say I grew up in quite a traditional Muslim home in as much as my parents were quite strict on me being the the girl, Mm. whereas my brothers had complete freedom. They could do whatever they liked. My older brother often would just go out and we'd not see him for two days because he'd stayed with friends. And it was very acceptable. Whereas for me, my parents were very strict. Going out was no option. Uh, A boyfriend would have been worse than murder. Mm. Um, And that's kind of how it was. But amongst all that, I would say I had a really happy childhood. Um, It was a very loving home. Hmm. Latif and I got married in 1980 um, and we had an arranged marriage Mm -hmm. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of some of the traditions that Hmm. my family held. Let me just ask a a question then in terms of growing up in London in a Muslim family were you in quite a a densely Muslim area densely populated Muslim area of London no no, we were in quite a nice suburb of, of North London. Mm. Um, very so at nice. School, at school, you had lots of different types of friends. And were you, yeah. were you sort of wearing the head cover at school? No, my, my family were nominal Muslim. So they uh, would observe the holidays and the traditions, but weren't very strict as far as praying five times a day and okay. all of that. So I wasn't covered. I could wear what I liked. 
as long yeah. as it was modest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that was it. And I, I went to college and trained to become a private secretary. Mm. And I loved my first job. I worked in the city for a uh, ranked leisure as PA to the press officer. I absolutely loved it. But then our first child came along. We have a daughter and we have two sons all grown up and we're blessed enough to have four beautiful grandchildren Mm -hmm. two in the uk and two in america so yeah so that's a bit of my background really that's if tell us a little bit about where you grew up then too are you also london born and bred yeah uh, london born and bred but yeah i grew up in north london i did everything i was supposed to do as um, a person from my native country you know, it's a very tight community. My native tongue was uh, Turkish as well, so I learned uh, English when I went to school. Although we we weren't practicing Muslims, um, our culture reflected what our background um, religious beliefs were in the mm-hmm. way we were living. So, would you also, like Fatima, would you celebrate Eid and do different holidays, but not really spend much time in the mosque? My parents wouldn't celebrate Ramadan. Um, okay. They would celebrate the day, like Eid, for example. They would celebrate that in as much as if anyone came round from family that was younger, they would like give them money, uh, and, and I would get that as well from my relatives. Yeah, uh, and also we'd, and we'd only go to the mosque if someone died, um, and yeah, very rarely. Uh, okay. Hmm. So what did you think about God then, growing up? Well, me, I always knew, um, always knew there was a God, always. And, and the only um, name I could give to God growing up because of my background is Allah. So, mm. you know, God's Allah. Uh, and I, but I believed uh, in God, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and same for me. I mean, I, I just was told that we... We are Muslim and Allah is God. And I just accepted it and said, yeah, I believe there is a God. Mm. And his name is Allah. And that's just how it was, really. (laughs) And what was he like? Was he just distant, not very involved in your life and your thinking? Yeah, it was just for me. I just knew that there was a God, but I didn't used to think about him at all. Really, I didn't have any type of faith growing up. I just went along with whatever my parents said, really. Never really questioned anything. Mm. Okay, so when you guys got married then, that was how you both were? That was your background? Yeah. Yeah, growing up, I I always knew there was a God. I had to be a good person. I had Mm. to do good, be good. And if you didn't, you know, God would punish you. So it's more like a, a big stick God. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and used by my mum a lot. My mum used to say, be careful, otherwise God will punish you and all this type of thing. So I never really viewed God as someone that, you know, you can know. I mean, far be from that. It's just just yes. someone's going to judge yes. you. Uh, just be careful. That's a really <clears throat> important point worth dwelling on, I think, that sense of can you know God? Because I remember even as a young teacher in London, I did an assembly about, um, I think it must have just shared my testimony and talked about how I come to know God. Um, and it was just so different to believing in a God. And afterwards, I remember one of the sixth form Muslim girls came up to me. She was from southern Pakistan. And she came up and said, did you say you can know God? I, I can't get my head around that. It's such a, mm. an alien concept to most Muslims. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah. 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 I, was, um, I was a bit like Fatima's brother's. Growing up, I could do what I wanted, and I did. You know, I just basically, with my cousins, just went out gallivanting all over the place. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when time came to settle down, it was like I I reached a point where I thought, well, I've had enough of this. You know, it was really time I got married. And that's when I asked my my parents to find me someone. Mm. Uh, And then not long after, I saw Fatima at a wedding, and I I just saw her, and I thought, that's the one I want. Love at first sight. (laughs) Yeah, probably, yeah, um, probably lust at first sight, to be honest. (laughs) um, So they went round and asked for her, 
And at first, they said, well, she's too young because she was 17. Oh, and um, how old were you at this time? I, I was 21. 21. So in those days, we used to get married young. Yeah. And, you know, it was just normal to do that. And then we had a, a Turkish wedding where they pinned money on us. And then, yeah, spent half that on um, another half on the house. If I could just um, say, um, so we got married and it was a great occasion. Um, but very sadly, my dad died six weeks afterwards at oh. the age of 51. Gosh, I'm sorry. It was such, such a trauma such a difficult time so mm. unexpected so that really really uh knocked me for six my mm. mum was widowed at 45 wow and she never ever remarried um mm. my youngest brother was 18 at the time i was 20 and it was just very very sad Mm. very sad mm. so that was something that happened very early on in our marriage that was completely unexpected and yeah. so difficult gosh yeah you then have had a huge change at quite a young age one getting married yeah. um two yeah. losing your father and yeah. we didn't really ask how did you feel about the arranged marriage i mean even if it's what you expected would always happen how did you feel yeah. I can remember my dad sitting me down. I was 18 mm. and saying to me, do you know what he said? It's entirely up to you. I'm not forcing you to do anything. You can make your own choice. Mm. But they are a good family. Mm -hmm. And he is a good young man with a good job. And he'll be able to provide for you and look mm. after you. And... I loved my dad so much and respected mm. him so much that I just agreed. So oh. at the age of 18, I had agreed to marry a complete stranger. Wow, I mean, had you never met? We'd never spoken. Wow. We'd never spoken until the evening of the betrothal. Gosh. And so, and it wasn't even um, just the parents, the aunts were there, the uncles were there, the cousins were there. Like my, my parents had a house full of people and I can remember my dad standing up and saying, well, we all know why we're here. We're here to betroth our two children, um, Latif and Fatima. Mm. And Latif, do you want to marry my daughter? And he said, yes. And he said, Fatima, do you want to marry Latif? And I said, yes. And then everyone cheered and clapped and celebrated and the food came out and the drinks came out. And I ran into the kitchen and, and Latif followed me and he said to me, well, that wasn't so bad, was it? And that was the first time we spoke. Oh. So I've, I've agreed to marry a complete stranger that I've never even spoken to. Yeah. And when you ran into the kitchen, were you about to burst into tears? Were you overwhelmed? In I was moment? just, I was embarrassed. Yeah. I was, I felt awkward, embarrassed. I, you know, as a teenager and young woman, I was pretty shy. And I put that down to just how I was raised, really. Yeah. Just kind of kept within the community and not much social life and all of that. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's wow. how it happened. <laughs> it's such an interesting insight because, yeah, I mean, this is this is a very common practice all over the world. So yeah. it, it shouldn't be that surprising. But because many of us in the West don't connect that much with people from different cultures, we often don't hear the full stories of, of how arranged yeah. marriages work. And some people have a very negative view of arranged marriages and some have a very positive view of it, you know, from in, within different cultures. Um but yeah, it's really interesting to hear how it was for you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, from a couple that didn't know each other to, you know, um, For, guess, 45 guess, years later. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> Quite frankly, Christ has kept us together. Yeah. yeah. Right. So. Okay. So what happened next? Okay. So I guess it would be fair to say that we didn't really get on. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We just, it was some sort of personality clash, some sort, we just really did not get on. 
Mm. There was, and I think my dad dying six weeks after I got married didn't really help um, our relationship. Neither of us knew how to handle it. Mm -hmm. um, Latif at the time was a serving Metropolitan Police Officer. Yeah. So that also had an impact on those early days. In terms and of he was doing a lot of shift work and different Shift hours. work, drinking culture, okay, and all of that. Mm -hmm. Do you want to interject there about how it, how it was? Yeah, um, yeah, the drinking culture was, was a bit of a shock to me, but I just thought that's part of what culture's like, and I'm just learning. I just thought that's the English culture, to be honest. Mm. Um, and I just went along with it. It was part of my job. Uh, but having said that, in our, in our culture as well, there's it's a big drinking culture. Really? Part of, from, yeah, it's like modern type Muslim. Well, it's so, because, yeah. But, um, yeah. So it wasn't that new to me. Uh, but then it sort of screwed me up in a way. Uh, it was disillusioned, having married to beautiful, beautiful women. Uh, but we just never got on. We clashed. And I thought, hmm, this is not supposed to happen. <laughs> so there was conflict in the very beginning in our marriage and what compounded it is that we didn't really know each other either and I was too busy to even think about it much I just knew that I weren't happy I know she weren't happy uh, and we just had conflict in our lives every day and our neighbours could hear everything they knew I was a, I was a policeman um, and then shame to say there was like abuse and violence and I, I remember one night it got so bad that I cried out to God whoever you are Jesus, Buddha, whoever I can think of, I need your help. Because a common conflict would be, oh, I'd be out drunk and stunk of alcohol, and I'd be waking up on the floor most mornings. And in the height of conflict the night before, it was a deep restlessness and torment that I was personally going through. And every day, you know, having another drink, you know, eased it off for a few hours, but then the next day was worse after right. having had conflict with my wife. So I remember one particular night, there was a real deep heart cry in my heart. You know, I didn't want it to be like this. Um, mm. I wanted to have a good marriage. I wanted to love my wife, but I didn't know how to. You know, my way of life is not really working. It's a complete dis disillusion about life. It, when I look back, I believe that God answered that prayer. I believe that God hurt and felt that heart cry that I needed him. I started to start to be hungry for God. I started to be a seeker, if you like. So if Jehovah's Witness knocked on the door, I'd, I'd invite them in. If mm. a film or program came on TV that uh, related to God, I'd watch it. Um, yeah, a couple of long stories short. Fatima and I were invited to, we found ourselves in this meeting, uh, in this Christian meeting, where they were talking about God. Um, and it was like a, a, a person, a preacher at the front. We were actually in, in a football stadium, and it was a mission. You know, that's what it was. Mission to London yeah. with Louis Palau. The, the, the singing, the worship was really just, uh, it was amazing. It was a unique experience for us. For me personally, it was beautiful. It really was. But then, more above all, when he started preaching, we were talking about where we look for answers in life. And he basically went down all the roads I've been down. Some of mm. us are looking for ambition, some, uh, you know, like money or uh, sex or drugs or alcohol. And I've been down all those roads, apart from the drugs one. Um, they were all dead ends, all of them. And, uh, and, and I thought, well, yeah, well, what's he going to say next? And then he spoke about God. He spoke about Jesus. He spoke about sin. He spoke about us being separated from God, basically went through the gospel uh, and uh, that Christ actually died on the cross for us. And, mm. uh, the, the fact that, you know, he technically, theologically, I didn't know, understand anything about Islam much really, but he said that Jesus died for me on the cross and he died for my sins, for me, that if you re repent and believe in him, you'll be saved. And you'll know him and your life will change. And I thought, whoa, you know, when he said, that Jesus died for me on the cross, it just cut my heart. I just believed it straight away. There's mm. no, you know, no, just that was it. It was a miracle in my heart. Um, and then there was this altar call, and I went to get up to go forward. 
and uh, Fatima grabbed my arm. She dug her nails into my arm. And she <laughs> said, if you take one step forward, finished. And wow. So, so being the man I am, I sat back down. <laughs> 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 so, because, um, yeah, uh, uh, as you know, the, the Muslim faith is a very anti-Christ faith. And coming from the background we come from, actually converting to Christianity is an unforgivable sin. Yeah. You would be completely ostracized, cut off, disowned. Mm. And so it was fear, fear of the repercussions that made me make him sit down. Yeah. On reflection, it's only the Lord that took us there because in a human sense, there's no way we would have gone to a mission to London to hear the gospel, but God worked it out even back then in our 20s. He was calling us, but we didn't know it at the time. And so two days after that meeting, the friend that had invited us, um, one of the assistant ministers from his church did a home visit with us. Mm. And he came over and he gave the gospel again, explained it thoroughly and, and led both of us through a prayer, a salvation prayer and a prayer of repentance. Mm. And I can remember just being so moved emotionally and crying. But that is where it stopped for me for five years. Oh. I did nothing with it. I would say it was a head knowledge mm. rather than a heart knowledge, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But Latif never looked back. Well, what happened to me that night is I gave my life to the Lord on my knees mm. and um, I was moved emotionally. I was weeping. Um, I was a detective at the time. I was hard-hearted. So it was, it was ironic, really. There's, there's no evidence <laughs> uh, as a detective apart from what happened to my heart. You know, my heart changed. I felt God's love. I felt his presence. I mm. felt like a ton had lifted off my shoulders. I mm -hmm. felt cleansed, I felt pure, I felt it was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And um, from that moment onwards, I, I didn't care about what people thought. You know, it doesn't make me better than anyone else. I mm -hmm. thought, you know, everybody needs this. And I couldn't put the Bible down, especially the New Testament, the book of John, and I couldn't stop talking about him after that. I didn't care where I was, who I was talking to. Uh -huh. If they stood still long enough, they'd hear about Jesus. And it <laughs> created a lot of problems. It created a lot of problems, but yeah, it's, it's still it still does. And to be honest, where we are now, we're in a context where we have to build relationships up. And it's long term, and I find it a bit muzzling. So mm. it's, it's a very new to us at the moment where we are in our context. Uh, sure. Well, we'll we'll come back uh, to yes. yeah the, the relocation and moving back into the mm. Middle East um, and the countries around there. But uh, I mean, that's amazing. Yeah, God's grace just just overwhelming your heart and releasing you from the, the shame and the just the, the dead ends mm -hmm. that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And that, that's wonderful. And I presume you, did you on your own, Latif, start going to church for a while then? No. Well, first two things happened straight away, if you like. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to drink again. I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's wrong. You know, those people listening that have a drink, I understand that. Jesus drank, you know, it's no problem. You just don't get drunk, you know. But yeah. I just didn't want it. I didn't want to drink. I yeah. just didn't need to. Did well, for you, it was associated with a, a, a major coping mechanism. And yes, oh, you, you mentioned some other things too. Between you guys, alcohol became a, a poison, really, and, and it affected yeah, you very bad. That, that's well clarified, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, that thanks. That's exactly it. And then the second thing is that the way I saw Fatima, I, I saw her differently. I didn't see her as someone that just met my needs, someone that's going to cook for me, someone that... If I had enough of her, I'd just change her like a changing shoes, you know, like mm. a, a contract, you know, a marriage type contract. I didn't see her like that. I, I started to see her like Jesus, I believe, mm. since uh, someone that I should serve, love, cherish, uh, just like in Ephesians. So I, I started to learn that, you know, I, I haven't sussed it completely, but I'm trying to learn that. Yeah. Tell me about some of the problems you mentioned uh, encountering in in your professional life, or just on this, on this, with your community, perhaps, as you're starting to talk about Jesus everywhere you go. Yeah, my mum was family wise was the closest person to me, so I went and told her, 
and she spat in my face and said, get out of my house and don't come back until um, you're a Muslim. I, I mean, I had a key to my mum's house. Mm. Uh, she never asked for that back, so I left. Uh, and then a week later, I came back, and she had a big smile on her face. I said, oh, you, you're back home. You're Muslim. I said, no, but I love you. And then she kicked me out again. So that oh. went on for about yeah. six months to a year. Really? Uh, but eventually, she could see I didn't grow two heads or anything peculiar. <laughs> if anything, she could see that our marriage started to heal. Uh, right. But it, it was something that she would never admit to that Christ changed it and still to that till today wouldn't and doesn't. Okay. But um, yeah. she knows. She knows. Yeah. yeah. I was just very much a slow burner. And I think that was partly linked to fear of repercussions. Mm. Um, but I was watching, observing just the change in Latif was just incredible. Mm. incredible it was almost instant and such a witness to me as his wife so praise god we then were blessed with our two other children our daughter was two or three at the time this all happened and then mm. we were blessed with our two sons and i'll fast forward to about 1989 1990 um, Latif had left the police force mm. and had gone into corporate sales in, in the city and was very, very successful. Mm. And he and two other colleagues started their own company. And Latif was one of the directors. Very successful, doing really well. And then I remember, as clear as anything, he came home one day from work and he said to me, the Lord has told me to quit my job. And I said, what? <laughs> you can imagine the reaction. I was yeah. like, no, you, you're not hearing right. You need to get confirmations. You can't just, he said, Fatima, I know 100% I need to get out. I don't know why, but I just do. And so he, he resigned from this company, mm. gave up all the benefits the income, everything. Mm. And it wasn't until three years later why the Lord pulled him out of that job. It turned out that the other two directors were fraudulently signing off invoices and accounts and Latif, as the third director, would have wound up in prison. Gosh. The other two did actually go to prison for fraud. Wow. He would have gone to prison. And that whole experience just encouraged me so much. I knew that Jesus was real. The mm. Lord was real. God had his hand upon our lives. He mm. was protecting us, looking after us. And it was just wonderful. But during that time, I don't know, you're probably too young to remember this, but um, back in, I think, 89, they called it Black Friday or Black Monday. Something happened in the banking system and the interest rates jumped. 15% they went up overnight. Our mortgage was £800 a month. The following day, it was 2000 Gosh. Back in 1989, can you imagine? And then it affected the economy, it affected everything. And as a result of um, financial difficulties, we actually had to give up our home. We mm. couldn't maintain it because it was just negative equity. Lots mm -hmm. of people lost their homes at that time. Mm. So my mum very kindly said we could go and live with her until we sorted ourselves out. Now, she was living on her own. As, as I mentioned earlier, she was widowed at a young age. Mm. And so we did. But all the time, we were kind of secret believers. Mm -hmm. We would have our little Bible studies with our three little children in our bedroom and take communion mm. as a, a little family. And, and we were unchurched. 
we were not in fellowship at all. But the Lord was like directing me so strongly to share my faith with my mum. And I was so fearful, so fearful. Yeah. I knew he wanted me to do it. And so I mean, you, you'd already lost, you'd lost your dad. And I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure there's something in your hesitation and your fear about, even though he'd gone about disappointing him with this new faith journey. Um, and then yeah. to, to think about how your mum could also reject you guys after the experience with your mother. And yeah. All, it must've been terrifying. Absolutely right. It yeah. was because me and my mum was so, so close. I mm. mean, she adored my children. They, mm-hmm. They became her world, really. It yeah. filled the void of losing her husband at such yeah, a young yeah. age. Yeah. And um, now you're living with her too. So, so yeah. you're financially connected. Yes. And so the opportunity came and I basically just told her that um, I was a Christian. I believed in Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins. Gave her the gospel and the backlash was horrendous I mean really horrendous she screamed she passed out she attacked Latif and said he's done this to me he's put me through so much already and now he's made me a Christian and this is so wrong and I'll never forgive you and you need to get out you cannot live in my home anymore so there we were a family of five finding ourselves homeless pretty much. Mm. And so Latif the next day, I mean, the tension in the house was terrible. Mm. Mm. Next day went along to the housing office at the local council, explained the situation, and the guy said, well, you know, you're going to wind up in bed and breakfast until we can get you something more permanent. Mm. And so we're like, okay, Lord, you're allowing this. We trust you. We're sure it's for our own good, all the rest of it. Um, But the following day, the housing officer phoned us up and he said, it's very unusual, he said, but a three-bedroom property has just come up. Hi, folks. We have a new way that you could help us out at Raw Mission. Besides writing us a review or giving us a five-star rating, if these stories that we're sharing are impacting you and encouraging you in your faith and ministry, could you send us a 10 to 20 second audio message? Just tell us your first name, what you like about the show and how God is speaking to you through it and where in the world you're listening from. We know that we have listeners in about 100 nations, so we'd love to hear from you. Perhaps you could also tell us what your favorite episode has been. You could use one of the free file transfer websites or just send an audio file to matt at frontiers.org.uk. Thanks, guys. And now let's get back to the podcast. In the area in North London we were living, which would mean the children stay in the same school, Hmm. I'll meet you there and you can have a look. So we went there and it was the most beautiful three-bedroom house and we agreed to take it. And he said, can I ask you something? And I said, yes. He said, are you believers? And we said, yes. He said, I knew it. He said, I'm a believer. And this had God's signature all over it. This never, ever happens, ever happens. And so, praise the Lord, God wow. God found us at home, and we lived there for seven years, seven yeah. years, and then we were able yes. to buy our own property again. That's amazing. So when you so, first spoke to the housing officer, you just said, look, we've been living with my mother, and we've just had yeah. this big fallout, and so we, she's yeah. trying to out of the house. So you hadn't mentioned anything about faith and all that, nothing, why you nothing. had the big fallout. So for nothing. him, he was just... Wondering why he discerned it. Maybe yeah. the Lord showed him. You yeah. know, the process was very quick. That's as well. Yeah, in, in, he said, "I knew it." He it, said <laughs> the housing process was extremely quick. Yeah, so that's why he said God's signature was all over it. He was all over it. So yeah, and that's what made him think. He asked the praise God. God. But then yeah. we started um, attending church regularly. Yeah, because we weren't attending church, and this guy introduced us to the church he went to. So we, so we started uh, going there. So just 
tell us then how things developed with your mother, Fatima. Yeah. To begin with, because um, obviously you, you found this church, an amazing provision of a house, but you're still grieving. Yeah. It was, it was the worst case yeah. scenario. It was everything you imagined it would be, her anger, her her throwing you out and so on, the children losing their grandmother. Yeah. What happened with that relationship? So we we moved into the property and... God was very good. It wasn't long before we reconciled and she was back in our lives and we were mm. back in her life. And our relationship was wonderful yeah. until she died, mm. you know. So, yeah, yeah I yeah. thank God for that. Yeah. Sometimes I think the initial reaction is is just yeah. all out of emotion and it can come back sometimes no, that really is it yeah. isn't it and, and there is no reconciliation think, yeah with your mother it's a different story yeah there. it's just it's always <laughs> been the same I mean, um, I mean, oh. yeah it's always it's always no, nothing different really with mother yeah okay yeah. but it's worse you know, so. mm. i've tried every which way i can you know mm. patience over the years love begging um yeah. Anger. You know, it's never yeah. good. Yeah. You know, when what's very important to me, um our, our relationships, you know, full stop anywhere. Um to to thought of, of my mum being without the Lord is horrific. Or anybody, to be honest, anybody without the Lord is horrific. Yeah. So uh but yeah, I've just God's teaching me. You know, that um, he's the one that works the miracle of the heart. But, you know, um, I just sort of see I'm accountable as I know people and they need to hear about the good news. Mm. I guess that's the, the urgency that God has given me in my heart to share the good news, really. So I've just got to control that a bit more, you know, mm. and be wise. Uh, I've got a slightly tough question for you. Um do you, when you look back and, you know, you, you think about, okay, here's how we sort of broke the news to our families. Do you ever look back and think, ah, well, I wish we'd done that a different way or at a different time or something. I can't imagine how difficult that must be. So I, I don't think anyone's got the answers for this, but is there, mm. or let's put it another way. If you are talking to a, another Muslim background believer who's come to faith and they're thinking through, what do I say to my parents, my brothers, sisters, do you, what would you advise them now with hindsight of having gone through all this yourself? Well, we, we have part of a, what I've been doing in London has been reaching out to, you know, people like Pakistanis, you know, mm. um, some of them, I would say a bit more radical, but generally talking to people where it's an even closer community and the Lord giving us a privilege to see a few of them come to the Lord. Mm. But uh, one particular young man, he's, he put his faith in Jesus about three, four years ago now, and he's he dare, he won't even download an app on his phone, mm. you know, let alone come to um, a church. He talks to us and asks us now and then about advice. Mine isn't to do what I did. Mm. That advice is not. It, it would be, look, just be, just love them. Let them see Christ in you, in the way you conduct yourself, the way you behave. Let them see grace. But then you don't want to mould into back into where you were. At mm. some point, you need to share something that happens in your life that is undeniably the work of God mm. and Christ. Jesus said that if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. you know, right. that, if you put that to someone like that, as from an early time, it's not the right thing to do. I doubt it very much, unless the Lord leads you to. But the right time in my life, although I was, I guess some people would call me brave in the way I shared Christ, there were times when some of my family were on their deathbed. Mm. Um, they knew I was a Christian, but there was two times where I was tongue-tied. I couldn't say anything. And I felt one of the time, I felt all that. I wasn't ashamed of Christ, but I thought, what stopped me from saying something? Was it because I was ashamed? When I read that, after I read that scripture, when I read that scripture, I just felt at that time, that's never going to happen to me again. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. You know, I love him. You know, look, look what he's done for me in my life and 
you look at our relationship, Lord, how can I ever deny you? So it's not something you can push to someone, but right. it's something yes. that will happen at the right time as you grow up in Christ. And that's what these young mm. believers, especially from our background, need to know. Yeah, know. that's really helpful. Thank you. Uh, I um, Yeah, I do often bump into church leaders and chat with them about this, and they say, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we've had a couple of Muslims come to faith or be baptized in our church recently. And I do often then say, well, what happened next with their family? And yeah, have you had any thought about how to coach them, you know, as they either wrestle through the persecution and opposition or ideally take it back a bit and coach them before they have those conversations so that they can communicate good news rather than, unfortunately, you know, as, as our colleague Mike often says, if we just say, I've become a Christian, sometimes what people are hearing is not good news it's not about jesus mm. it's actually just i'm a traitor i'm rejecting you i'm exactly. rejecting your community exactly. i'm rejecting our family and that's not what you're trying to say you're trying no. to say i've found the most incredible god the only god and he's so much more loving than you realize that's what you're trying to communicate but it's not coming yeah. across sometimes isn't and it that's gonna have to slow down a bit more because you know in our context now saying those things that would be exactly how they would react but it's doing life. It's, it's God in you, working through your life, that might be the thing that people need to see. For example, one situation with my mum, she'd stopped talking to my auntie for 15 years. A few mm. years ago, we were talking about that, and I said, Mum, are you comfortable with that? Yeah, but she shouldn't have. And oh, I understand that, but do you love her? Yes, I do. And there's something that I want to share. You know, love, mm. love your enemies. Is one of the most powerful scriptures amongst Muslims. I've been in situations where everyone's talking about how good they are, and then they go and slay other people, say, well, they did this to me, that to me, and I'll never forgive them. Yeah. And in our tradition, our culture, there are people that put curses. They curse people, and that they actually put them in the graves. That's how venomous it is. They'll write a curse and put the curse into the grave. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But when you talk about the unforgiving servant, do you remember mm. the story in the Bible about the unforgiving servant? When you explain something like that, it's something very new to people in our culture. Yeah. But that's what God's like. If you don't forgive, he won't forgive you. Mm. Um, so what you're saying is there are ways to live your life that will start to soften uh, your families, your friends' hearts towards the gospel, yeah. and they'll start to see you changing. And that gives a bit of a platform for your words when you do start to share more about Jesus. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's, like I mean, the, the thing is, the key thing is, isn't it? If, if we are ungodly in our words and our sort of aggressive, unwise evangelism, then the fault is on us. It's not actually the gospel mm. that's causing the offense. Mm. If you're persecuted and you've been kind, you've been gentle, you've been loving, you've been clear with the gospel and you're still persecuted, that's not on you. That's, yeah, yeah. That is the gospel that is causing yeah. the offense. Yeah. So, Fatima, kind of bring us up to speed then with, you know, where oh, you are now. I know you can't say exactly where you are in the Middle East now, yeah. but um, why you ended up there? You know, how did the journey okay, develop? So, um, fast forward, um, Latif and I have, have for 20 plus, maybe more years, have um, been in churches where we've served and mm. Latif's been a deacon and six years prior to coming to where we are now, he was serving with London City Mission mm -hmm. uh, with uh, reaching out to Muslims. But awesome. a year ago, Latif was at a conference and one of the first countries they prayed for was the country we're now living in mm. and he was very very impacted and very very moved and really felt that the Lord was drawing us here mm. I was back in London and it was just completely supernatural I would say because I was actually in North London and I our, our plan was our plan always was that when Latif retired from the mission that we would go back to our property in North London and yeah. just live out our days there and that was that, end of mm -hmm. our working lives. So that was always the plan. 
And this particular day, I was in North London running an errand for Latif's mum. And I drove past our property because she only lives five minutes from where our property is. And there was no connection. There was no desire to go back. It, it's like everything that property stood for, our family home where we'd raised our children, where mm. we two had married and left from, mm. there was no connection. Mm. And the Lord was really speaking to me and showing me he was calling me here to where we are now. Yes. And so when Latif rang me that evening, because uh, he'd ring every evening to say what had happened at the conference and everything. Yeah. He said, oh, let me tell you about my day. I said, before you say anything, I said, the Lord, I believe, is calling us to this country. Wow. And he said, that's exactly the same thing. I just know we're meant to be here. That's wild. And all I can say, Matt, is that it happened so quickly. Mm. We knew 100% the Lord was calling us out here. And everything that followed was so quick. The, the purchase of the property, it was just so providential. Just everything just fell into place. And we knew the Lord wanted us here yeah. to reach the people in the community in which we're in. Gosh. We're in a village, but it's more like a town. There's about 4,000 people. Mm. Yeah. So we've only been here six months. Okay. But I can remember one of Latif's colleagues saying to him, you know, when the Lord calls you onto the field, it usually happens very quickly. And it really happened quickly. I mean, we didn't have time to think. There was so much to do all the shipping, all the yeah. admin staff, all the this, all the that. But praise God. So we moved in here December 3rd last year. Mm. It was a difficult time to come, really, because it's the first time we've not been with our children and grandchildren at Christmas, or at least the Christmas season. Yep. That was difficult. But, you know, you have to let go and let God they're all adults living their own lives. Mm. And two of them are believers. The youngest isn't. So yeah. he, it would be pointless explaining to him the, or sharing the testimony of what the Lord did. He'd just be like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so in some ways, the cover story is that we've retired out here. Yeah. So that protects us to a degree because Latif was coming to this country about 10 years or so ago on short-term mission trips and bringing mm. people with him. Mm. And so a lot of the people in this community remember that and that can be quite inflammatory, but the cover story being that we've retired out here yeah. has made the transition a lot easier. Yeah, well, we are. Um, well, we are retired. Like, like, you know, <laughs> we don't not... have paid jobs anymore. So yes. Some of the locals welcomed us because we're retired. Yeah. Um, but but what, one of the things that knowing where God wants you is so important because I, I reached a point in my Christian life is that, Lord, look, you want me to do this, please make it clear because I'm getting older, I haven't got time, please make it clear. Signs yep. and but just please make it clear. Frankly, he hasn't stopped making it clear ever since mm. I prayed that. Mm. It's amazing. This particular time, he's made it really clear. And mm. That's been really encouraging. A change of heart for Fatima, that's, that's the big thing for me. And even having gone through all that, we reached a point here at one point where we still doubted, even though we were living here and that. And, and it took two white women in a remote part in this area that God sent to us to say, God sent us to pray for you. Wow. Yeah. That, that yeah well, it was incredible. We you were... Know, when, um, we, when we were low, down in... We would, yeah. If I, it, yeah. It was such an incredible thing that happened. When we came last year to purchase the property, 
and complete the deal. That day, we were quite doubting and mm. is this right? Are we in God's will? Is this mm. where he wants us? We, You know, it's a major move, moving to another country. Mm-hmm. So we went to this um, archaeological site there is locally. They have a museum there. Mm. And it was about three in the afternoon and we pulled up and two white ladies um, pulled up, parked up. And I said to Latter, they must be believers. Why else would you come here? Because there's a church on the site and everything. Yeah. And um, so they greeted us. And I oh, believe it's yes. I oh, believe it's yes. And enjoy the museum. And then we were coming out of one museum room. And the ladies were across the courtyard and they walked over and they said, we hope you don't mind, they said, but the Lord delayed our visit here today. We should have been here at 10 in the morning, but the higher power wouldn't start. The keys wouldn't work. And he's delayed us because he wanted us to come here and pray for you. Mm. Just like that in the middle of nowhere. Amazing. And that was... God was so good to us because since that day we've not looked back. We know we're in his will. When they prayed for us, she prayed, please confirm, please keep confirming, Lord. And then she she read out Joshua 1, be bold, be strong, the Lord your God is with you. Be of good courage, yeah? Wherever you go. And then when I went back back to England in the work I did at LCM, the, the boss of LCM stood up and he was speaking. He said, uh, I just want to share a scripture, Joshua 1 8. Be bold, be strong for the Lord your God. Wow. Because like, this is all going on, my, and these little things, yes. we're not like that. We're not always looking for signs. But no, exactly. Spirit, yeah, but God's gracious, good. isn't he? At just the right time, yeah, you needed amazing. that. You needed that confirmation. You needed that encouragement. Yeah. And then you and suddenly. Also, think... to pull, sorry to try to pull myself yeah. away from the work I was doing in London, I, yeah. I poured my heart into it yeah. day and night for six, six, six and a half years. To these, you know, Muslim people, like yeah. Pakistanis through street work, door knocking, debates, you name it, with the helps. You know, we work hard and I led a team there and it's mm. so exciting. And to be pulled away from that, mm. it had to be God. And so yes. re- it was reluctantly, in yeah. one sense, I pulled myself away from that. But uh, that's this is beautiful. where God wants us. Yeah. Yeah, and you've been pulled, in a sense, from the centre out to the margins, from from the fertile yeah. sort of busyness and successful yeah. ministries out to the desert. And it feels very discombobulating, I suppose. Like, oh, why are we out here? What is going on? We don't really yeah. know what we're doing. Yeah. And that's when the Lord is, yeah, sometimes so gracious with, with that extra mm-hmm. sign, that extra encouragement, that word that you needed to sustain yeah. you. And what I was going to say was just, and you suddenly get this little yeah. image of, wait, the Lord moved people from Canada to visit and delayed their trip to meet us. You suddenly think God is sovereign over the universe. He he really does move the people around the world and speak to his people and guide. And it's such an encouragement, isn't it? Because we do often think, oh, when did I last hear something from God that was deeply for me? And Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. So, all right, as we wrap this up, What's your vision? What's your heart? What's your dream for where the Lord's brought you? Um, are you with anyone else there, or are you hoping that others might come and join you? Well, um, <laughs> we know one thing that we're confident of and encouraged about is the fact that we're meant to be here. If people feel they are or they want to, they can come and continue and take over. We'll help mm. them, or they can come and be part of what we're doing, and we'll help them. These people in this country... They definitely are downtrodden um, and forgotten. And forgotten. They mm. remind me, they're not going through that now, but they remind me of the Jews and the Holocaust. We, we have family that have, we've lost, you know, through those, that sort of genocide type situation. They um, have really won our hearts. We, we, we love them, they're endearing. The system here is a shambles. Mm. It's yeah. corrupt. I'd love to see the, the Lord plant something in this village and then replicate that in all the villages that's not happened in this country i'm not god but i know that this needs to happen because yeah you know they need to know about jesus yeah so you're surrounded by dozens and dozens, hundreds of villages that are 
all yeah. Muslim with barely yeah. a Christian witness. If Hardly a... any. Yeah, there's yeah. some work here. There are some. There workers are some here. workers here. Yeah, there are workers here, um, but indig indigenously, maybe if that count on one hand. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm, okay, and, and just then. Yeah, Fatima, give us a little picture of daily life, daily problems, daily hassles that you suddenly found yourself in in this very different world to London. Um, okay, I think I mentioned earlier, random power cuts, no warning, it will just happen. The yeah. fastest internet speed is 15 meg, if you can believe that. Wow. <laughs> Gosh, it's amazing so you're doing this podcast, really. <laughs> Yeah. So daily life, I mean, the culture here, I actually really love the culture because it's open house. Mm. You know, you can't really plan anything because yeah. somebody will just turn up. You could be getting ready to go out and somebody will just walk into the house. You leave your doors open in oh, the wow. summer. Yeah. And people will just come in, say, hi, are you home? I've come for a coffee. <laughs> So there's that, but I like that, that yeah. part of the culture I really love. We've not felt lonely since we've been here, so I praise mm. God for that. Um, we've always had people um, been very kind, they've taken us out, showed us some sights. As far as navigating the um, system, or the best description is shambolic and corrupt. One thing that's become really vital for us is our daily devotion mm. because um, we're lacking in fellowship somewhat because obviously we're here and our focus is where we are. There mm. are some churches that we have visited. One's about an hour away um, and one's 20 minutes away. We have visited, but the leaders there... I think would have loved us to get involved with their work and their vision. But we know that we're very much specifically called for a new work mm. in this location. Okay. And so that's our vision and our focus. So we may we'll wake up, we'll you know, have our daily devotion. That's first thing we do before breakfast, anything. Um, and then Someone might just turn up randomly and say, oh, what yeah. are you doing today? Do you fancy going for a drive to the mountains? Mm. Well, okay, we'll come. Yeah. Um, how, how, really are the roads? Like, how are the roads? How are the roads there? There's no infrastructure. The main roads right The dual there. carriageways are good, but everywhere, there's no infrastructure. There's no drainage system. Mm. So when it yeah, rains, yeah. our street floods. Mm. Uh, you can't drink the water, tap water. You have to have bottled water. Mm. You have to use gas cylinders for your mm. oven. Mm -hmm. Navigating anything here has been exasperating. It really has. We've run from one government building to another, to another. Mm -hmm. One tells you one thing. Yeah. You get that paperwork. Then you go oh, to yes. where they've told you, no. You don't need that. We need this. And on and on and on it yeah, goes. Absolutely. So frustrating. And it yeah, really I remember is that. Who you, you know. <laughs> yeah, who you know, what they're waiting who for. Who you know. Yeah. yeah. As long as you Sorry. grease their palms, you can get something done. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had a few experiences like that. Yeah, yeah. It took about three and a half, four months to just complete all the admin we had yeah. to complete to make us legal here and. Yeah. All of that. So now we we we're pretty settled. We've had mm. lots of house guests. Um, two of my work colleagues just left um, Thursday morning. Mm. They decided to fly over and have a girls' break in nice. this beautiful place. Mm -hmm. And is, then, it, is it beautiful? It, there there are yeah, some, it yeah. is, some geographical it really areas. Is. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it really it's is beautiful. It really right. is. Yeah. I just want to commend you guys because it would be very easy for I mean, hundreds and hundreds of Brits your age would just say, you know what, let's go and get the best of southern Spain and do our last 
10, 20 years, just living in southern Spain, enjoying the beach, and yeah. eating out and drinking out around the Mediterranean. But you've, yeah. you've decided, no, you know, we don't want to just while our days away in, in sort of gentle pleasures, really. And you've decided, no, we're going to keep pursuing God and keep seeking yeah. um, after his heart and his heart for the lost and the nations. And that's just, that's a wonderful thing. And I want to encourage any of our listeners out there, you know, whatever your age is, you know, the Lord's not done with you. You know, he, yes. he can use us all in, in praying and giving and sending and going. And it just, yeah. you know, if we're open to that um, and, and he'll pave the way, it won't be easy, but he will pave the way and he will be with you. That's a great verse that you just mentioned so many times there, um, Latif, you know, for us to think about the Lord is with you wherever you go. Be strong, be courageous and keep pressing yes. in after God's yes. heart. Yeah. Any final thoughts you want to leave with our listeners? Any final encouragements? I think what I'd like to say, Matt, is that there's no other better place to be than in God's will. Mm. So if anybody is listening and, and the Lord has laid it on their heart and he confirms it and they go, that really is the best place to be, mm. is to be in his will. And the Lord will give you the peace and the encouragement and the confirmation because he's faithful and loving and merciful mm. because that's what he's done for us. And anyone that knows me knows I don't particularly do well with change. Mm. So this was such a major move, but the Lord has just given me such peace mm. and such encouragement mm. to come and to serve mm. and to be in his will. Yeah. What Since being here, I can truly affirm everything starts from Jesus. So as we live our lives here, we've had to do that. This devotion, our church is in the mornings. There are a couple that we, we go to now, but it starts from Jesus in the morning, our relationship with him, prayer, sacraments, prayer, worship, fellowship, the Bible, the word, and living that out. Mm. And then from that comes the fruit. And from that, we're trusting that the church will grow. Mm. So I, I think that's a model for church members in whatever context they are, in the UK, anywhere in the world, to, to remember it start from the gospel. That's where it starts from, not a denomination. Yeah, that's a great word because, you know, all of us involved at Frontiers, we're not looking to reproduce denominations or Western forms of churches. We're looking to draw people to Jesus. And as they meet and gather Whatever form that takes, you know, that's less important than them knowing Christ, knowing his salvation, knowing who he really is and, and what he offers. Yeah. That's what we love about this agency. We're sort of on the same page with that. So. Mm. Yeah, well, we're delighted to have you uh, come and join us. And thank you for being with me today and sharing your story so powerfully of how you came to Christ. And yeah, definitely, it's an encouragement. I hope we'll, as listeners and you know, we'll, we'll keep praying for these guys as they're pioneering in a new season of their life and a new place. Um, yeah, the Lord bless you and make the work of your hands fruitful in many, many ways, more than you can imagine, more than you can expect. And even Thank while you. you're out there, you know, I pray too that while you're out there, the Lord will bless your family back in London and that some of mm -hmm. them will be drawn to Jesus more than if you'd stayed in London. Yeah, yeah that, I know. That's, that's my prayer for you today. Thank you, guys. God bless. Thank and you, Matt. Great to connect. All right. God bless Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today, guys. As we close, I want to offer you a gift. It's a beautiful invitation to come and join in with the mission of God, the transformational, life-giving gospel work that he has set before us. The Lord asks in Isaiah, Who will go? Whom shall I send? Could it be you? Might you be willing to lay it all down, to give up everything for the one who gave up everything for you? to join one of our teams in Central Asia, the Gulf, Africa, Asia, the Balkans, or the Caucasus, or to support some of our work through prayer and finances. If your heart is stirred to respond, do reach out to us. You can contact me on matt at frontiers.org.uk or visit our website, frontiers.org.uk, or you can check out our social media platforms at Frontiers UK. God bless, guys, and do join us next time for some more inspirational and challenging stories.